This is the last in the series of the dreams, and therefore I chose fate and providence. Now, how fate and providence plays into the realm of dreams and everything we've talked about up to this point, I hope to make clear. So then, what are they? How do they function? Now, let me go back into the world of dreams and give you a fresh dream and encourage your participation. This was done today. This is a discussion I had. I was, uh, the gentleman who I talked with said it was perfectly all right to use it tonight so that we have his approval and I thank him for it. Here's the dream he had. Now this is a relatively successful person and the dream he had, which was just uh, three days ago, puzzled him so much that he sought me out, and this is the dream. He's over here, he's the one wearing the glasses, and he goes over to none other than uh, the, uh, Lyndon Johnson, who at the time is president, and here are his colleagues, they're coming to him with their reports, their very important reports about the State of the Union. He reviews each one, and he sees they lack in a very fundamental way. Each has major weaknesses, and he re rejects one after the other. I'm there, says the man. He says, I'm there, and I'm listening to this, let me make sure I have my notes. I'm there, he says, and I'm listening. I'm impressed by the opportunity to be there. And the President Lyndon Johnson turns and says to me, as a professional, you must ignore what you have seen and do not report it. Where this gentleman in the picture turns out to be a newspaper reporter. He's a journalist. The journalist then says, okay, it's my duty to obey. I won't report to my editor this great story. He recognizes that it's an insight into government it also talks about the need for some major changes because these are his top people and if they're handing him reports that are in principle weak, it indicates some kind of a, a major crisis. In any case, our dreamer then simply says, okay, I'll go along with President Johnson. That's the whole dream. Now, what is it about this that worried the dreamer? Well, he said, first of all, that suggests, does it not, if this dream means anything, that there is something going on within me, he said, that bears some similarity to this dream. And there is some crisis going on of which I am privy to, I hear about it on the highest level, and I go along and do not report it, even though the person is a journalist who says I'm a journalist, and yet nonetheless he goes along with the president and doesn't report it. That disturbed him. He said, whether I like it or not, I can't get it off my mind. It irritates me that I would go along with it. He's irritated by his dream. It's three days, he said, whether he likes it or not, it interrupts him on many occasions in what he's doing. So I said, look here now. I don't know exactly what to do with this dream. But there must be some interesting state of mind that, that uh, it's key in this state. Maybe we can find it together. He said, well, the key state, or the part that interests me, 
is the state of mind I was in when I went along with it, he said. I said, well, whatever that is, and I didn't ask him to describe it, I just said, whatever that is, is there anything in your past that seems in any way analogous to this moment? Well, he was convinced <clears throat> that there was nothing, but there was something that kept coming up into his mind, and so we said to one another, we have nothing else to do over coffee, why don't we take a look at it? So this is what came up. Now, this occurred when the man was about, do I have it? Okay. Um, Eighth to ninth grade, transition to high school. Prior to this, um, his name was Peter, Peter. Let's call him Peter. That's his real name. Peter had played with a local gang, and he grew up in gangs in New York City. And at this point, a new friend enters into the picture. He's different, uh, level up in social status. He doesn't go with gangs. He's better in respect to into schools, into ideas, and it's a big graduation jump to have a friend like this. He pulls away from those others, and then he joins in this relationship. His friend comes to him one day and says, well, quite early in the relationship, let's skip school. Peter says, okay. Peter gets caught. Now, his mother then takes him by the hand and walks across Manhattan, some from, uh, he said, about six blocks, holding his hand very firmly, very sternly, forces him along. She is silent in her fury knocks at the friend's door. The mother comes out with the son. So the friend and his mother are together. And Peter's mother is here. And she says, I wrote down most of it, don't let your son play with mine. Mind is evil. He's no good. He'll get your son in big trouble have nothing to do with him, nothing will ever come of him, it's best if you separate these two and don't let your son play with them. They leave. Peter's in somewhat of a shock because this is the only, right, wait, wait, okay. This is the only time he, he heard what his mother has ever said about him, freely and openly. And it turns out to be a warning. Next day, Peter's mother gets a phone call, and his friend called. I don't have the name of his friend. His friend called, mother called, and Peter's mother says to Peter, why they called. They want to take you with them for a drive in the, to the country, according to this uh, he'd never driven in a car up through the country. All of his life was in New York City. Never got into a car. This is the first experience in a car and going out into the country. So what does Peter do? He says, no. That's the only time in his memory that he defied his mother when clearly she wanted something, he just said no, no discussion. Right. 
That ends the relationship. He never goes back and talks to the friend. He ends the relationship with his friend. Doesn't resume it in any way. His performance in school drops. It was poor before, but now it gets worse. And he stays close to home. He spent much more time out on the streets after this for some curious reason. He recognizes this was only because of our talk. He recognized that there was more time after this spent at home. Now all of these parts fit together in terms of a drama. Now Peter has to walk away <clears throat> and understand what's going on. Right, Peter today doesn't understand why he ended the relationship. He doesn't understand why his performance dropped. He doesn't understand why his mother did this. He doesn't any, understand any part of it. But what does he know? He knows that for many years he had a very poor educational performance. His grades dropped very low. He was kicked out of school. Uh, truant, uh, patterns of truancy continued after this. And then later there was a change and uh, then he went back to school and made something of himself in various ways. Now, is there any connection between the one and the other? According to our friend Peter, on reflection, this is what he now says about himself. Achieves up to a level That level has something interesting about it. To go beyond would mean he would have to then uh, join a more sophisticated group. Knowledgeable group. Backs away from it. Still modestly successful, still modestly successful, but this has always bothered him. He adds to it. On one level, there's no need for him to join this group. On another level, there is. So this is ambivalent. That is to say, he's attracted, but yet has good reasons for avoiding. So then, what can we say about this? Is it possible that he came to certain conclusions about this? And is it possible we can now go into the dream and see what his dream master is sending him? He's sending him a message. Would you agree from this story? And what's most interesting to me personally about the dream is that I'm always amazed by this. If our understanding is in fact relevant, then there, is a, then there is an ethic to the story. It presupposes an ethic. That is, that he should report this story to his editor. Even though here, he realizes, uh-oh, ambivalent, that he should report it to the, to the editor, but yet recognizes this is President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, and therefore he wants to do his duty, so he stays and cancels out the story. Now, the next thing I enjoy about this story, all right, it has an ethic, and two, it has a curious role for implications. 
if he were to violate this prompt, this request by the president and send the material to the editor, undoubtedly it would be published, major. Would that mean he would then be part of a more sophisticated, knowledgeable group? Would he then gain access to the kind of a story that would make him more of a journalist than a newspaper reporter? Can we say that if there were a fifth stage to this, and if he changed his mind, would that elevate him? All right, now, what, now we're now getting ready to look for things between the dream and the past that may be similar so that we can then look for patterns. That's our goal. Well, what happened at this point, working with Peter, is that he did say that that same ambivalent, I should do it, I should do it, I should go on and do it, but he's going to stay loyal. He took this, therefore, as staying loyal. Staying loyal. Staying, as it were, home. Peter also looked at this and he said that he had never really understood this dream in any way and didn't know whether in fact it could be understood. This event, he said, has baffled him for many years. He didn't know why. He said no, why he didn't say yes and go along. But then after discussion, he said there was a sense in which he got revenge for the humiliation that he suffered at the doorway. So therefore, he took that idea of revenge and he concluded after a few minutes, he began talking, and this was this afternoon. He said what was interesting is that um, He said, no, he would not report the story. He'll go along with the president. That is to say, he would be saying no to his career, to his editor, and that would keep him functioning on a lower level. That's equally true in the dream. So we then explored, if that's the case, it's such a sparse dream. There are only four things in one, two, three, maybe only three scenes, even though we broke it up into four. It's so sparse, yet it had the impact upon him. The impact upon him, again, was that this means there's something going on in his life that he is not seeing since nothing in his life suggests any of this. Therefore, he thinks it must be on the realm of his own psyche or soul or mind. That is, there's something going on that, he, that is similar. He doesn't know what it is, and therefore he's stuck. Well, we saw that he was staying loyal to the president, not reporting it. That meant at home, that's what he did. He stayed loyal. He began to consider this one possibility, which was very interesting. All right. He said, is it possible that my mother was actually jealous of my new relationship? He changed that 
and said that, this is quite interesting, that he thought that, he thought that it may be that his mother, Peter's mother, in that scene at the doorway was really trying to impress the other woman, the other woman, Peter's friend's mother, and this was really a way of trying to establish a relationship with her. And that what she was doing was using him and this scene as a way of establishing a certain level of integrity and sincerity that she hoped then would be open, that he hoped it would be open, pardon me, that he thought his mother then would be open to a relationship with his friend's son, his son's mother. Let me get that straight. So then what did he say? He said that my mother was jealous of my renewed relationship and it looked like, like she was courting one too. So therefore, by saying no, he was being loyal to mother and by revenge, ending her possible relationship with this other woman. He said up to this point, his mother had very few friends and this too looked like an entree into a similar kind of relationship and this ended it for both of them. So therefore, saying no, that he wouldn't go on and join that, that family and have a more extended, sophisticated relationship, then ended a whole new way of relating. It kept him at home. His mother allowed him to say no to her, which is for him the first time he ever defied his mother. And then that established a way of relating on a certain level. Uh, and that level, he claimed, was a level of mediocrity. Went back to the dream and said, what are the implications here in terms of the dream, in the dream? What is it to say that you won't report? What will that do to your own status as a journalist? And he used the same language. Peter said, I, I had that sense in the dream when I said I wouldn't report to my editor that I was willing at that point on to stay on a level of mediocrity. Now we're finding certain themes that are similar, aren't we? If we find things that are similar, we may find patterns. If there are patterns, then there may be meaning at stake. So we ask this one question. Now, I haven't worked too much with Peter. I knew him for, for some years um, professionally. He's a, a teacher at the college where I teach. Um, it's interesting because um, He's willing to now look at a series of dreams. So we asked whether or not he could see a series of dreams, record them, to see whether or not any theme continues so that we can take it over a longer period of time and see whether the same themes are coming through. But what was interesting for Peter is he said that his career right now happens to be at a curious crisis point. <laughs> and he can then move up or he can stay where he is. He can contribute as he's been doing to certain journals in a certain way, he's working, 
or he can scale back what he is doing and thinking. Well, what I asked, is it possible that you can take a look at what you're writing and see whether or not you're scaling it down? Is there something intrinsically weak about what you're doing? I mean, could there possibly be more similarities? We don't know. He's going to look it up. He, he, he didn't want to talk about it, so it stopped there. Let's see if I want. Um, when he said no, let me go back to that. There's a thought here I didn't put down. No, I won't be humiliated and make believe we're friends after that. So it's a real sense of a sense of humiliation of the past. Now, is it possible that that past scene is still so puzzling to him that since he can't conclude about it, he's now in the present, facing a crisis in his career and in his personal world that keeps him from judging certain certain things about himself as well as his career? Well, I don't have the answer to that. But he is willing now to look at a series of dreams, and hopefully uh, we'll get further into this. I would like to present you with a, a case where everything is all wrapped up and beautiful, but this is beautiful because this is what it is, and this is real, and this is what happened in the past couple of days of my life, and I wanted to share it with you. Now, let me put in some new things now. Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> Could it be, now I'm going to use a language, that he does feel and that he is blocked. He does believe that certain things are determined, fixed. Certain things are fixed. He would like to break through. The difficulty is he doesn't know exactly in what way. But nonetheless, this condition that he's in, that he calls blocked and determined, the language he used, is he recognized that there's something about it that's been with him for a long time. Therefore, it has, whatever it is, this has been preserving, it's preserved within him for quite a while. But there's something about that past scene it collects a lot of these things together. Each part seems to be coordinated with the other. There's some state of mind that runs through it all, a kind of certain sympathy, a certain sympathetic, sympathetic sense, uh, sympathy in that higher sense, uh, a pathos that runs through the whole thing. And that's all connected together and behind is that sense of humiliation and rejection. Now, in terms of philosophy, Platonic philosophy, what's interesting is that these are the key terms, these are the key terms that describe fate. It's when things are blocked, determined, fixed, that state is preserved over time, the parts that are involved in that fate are collected into a unity. They continue over time. Each part seems to be coordinated with each other. And there's a certain state of mind that runs through it all. That is to say, there's a connection. That is faith on the level of soul or mind. Faith, when it operates in physical things, the same thing. Everything is determined, fixed by laws of nature that preserves itself going through nature. You can take all of nature, it collect, collects into a unity. Each part's coordinated with each other part. There's one kind of sympathos for the entire nature through connection. And that is, it all fits and is determined 
and that is in the realm of the physical, or what is sometimes called the sensibles. Now, if it, now let, I'd like to pause for a moment, and I'd like to use some reflections that were made. I'd like to talk for a moment then about the point that we explored, we explored about, he is, now Peter is a person who has not approached things philosophical until the last five years or so. Maybe, maybe longer, no, not, not too much longer. He reports before that, that as far as he was concerned, the universe in which he lived takes on the following really interesting forms. There's no intelligibility in, in it. There's no intelligibility. There's no higher realm. And as far as he's concerned, therefore, <clears throat> we, he, is not in any way connected with anything. There's a ceiling over human existence. You can't get through it. There's no connection anywhere because there's nothing to be connected with. We are blocked in our own mediocrity. If there is anything higher, he claims, we are ignorant of it. For we have no connection at all with what is intelligible. This was his views. <clears throat> and he wrote a story which I read which expresses this entire drama. Therefore, he says, in terms of the way in which He functions with others. Everything was therefore at random, right? And he didn't have to be receptive in any way because there was nothing to be receptive to since there is a block beyond which our minds cannot go beyond. And therefore there was no need to establish any meaningful goals because the whole idea of meaning didn't exist. <clears throat> as a consequence, as a consequence then, among those that he knew and related with, there was no real necessity to communicate on a higher level since there was no basis for it. Therefore, no meaningful communication, no discussion of anything significant among them. And as he said, I have a good quote, um, football and TV and cigars is what you give and do with friends. Okay, therefore there was no possible way then he could integrate, he, no integration of his own experience on a higher level, there wasn't any higher level, no integration. Nor could he in any sense dispose of anything towards any good since he didn't see that there was any good for him to dispose it towards. Right. While he could strive for some goal, whether or not it was a meaningful goal, he wouldn't even know. Now. Um, so this leaves him, therefore, in respect to this world, lack of any meaning, nothing intelligible, sense of no purpose, incomplete, no purpose, incomplete, fundamentally incomplete, and um, selfish, which he didn't like. And there is no sense of any kind of power or energy and any kind of abundance.
just living through, as he had a great line. I lived my life through the weekly TV schedule. As the schedules come and go, so my life departs. <laughs> a great line. So, about five years ago, we started our relationship. And uh, I meet him over coffee every once in a while, and we explore. And uh, we talked about just one possibility. What would happen if we were to say that your dreams are meaningful? What if we were to say that your dreams are meaningful? Well, he said, good heavens. That would mean that there's a way in which intelligibility manifests itself in my life. He said, and if that came through dreams, he said, that would show one thing. That would show then that it has a direction. It can, if there's a connection between these two scenes, it's a way of getting guidance. It's a way of making connections with your past and present. It's a way of giving you hope in the future. And if that's the case, he came up with a very nice statement. He said, that kind of intelligence, if it were on your side, could be uh, functioning as a guard. Guard could benefit you. And he said, we would sure enjoy being dependent upon it. Now, he said he's living with his wife and family, and he raised this question. He said, you know what, if I could introduce this as two children, if I could introduce this to my family without being laughed at, he said, if you can, if this is true, if this is true, that there is an intelligibility that is open to us through dreams, that you can depend upon as a way of focusing your energies and your life's goals. And if I brought that into the family, he said, you know what? It would reduce then injustice in the family. He said, without a doubt, there's no doubt that we wouldn't be random in respect to one another, right? We'd be paying attention He said, curiously enough, it said that there'd be no rebels in the household as they are now, and no one would want to escape if there were such a direction from dreams. Because then he said, look here, you'd want to become associated with it, you'd like to encourage the development of it, you'd like to live and join, and join in that realm. He said, and therefore, this would end in the fact that we would then really be related on a higher level. And we would allow ourselves to see an emerging good. Now, this is where, where he stopped, because I pushed, I pushed a couple of steps, and I'd like to push the steps with you. I raised this point. If all of this can be said, if dreams can function in this way, 
then wouldn't we also have to say that there is a kind of ruling that dreams can contribute a direction. They can contribute a direction in a very interesting way because if it can give it an interesting direction, if these two things are related, then the dream master must be able to have the power to reach back into your personal past and pull out each of those things that are significant that you have to work on in order to see their connection. But if that's true, then this dream master must know the alpha and the omega of your life, the beginning and end of it. Must be so familiar with you and your language and what's happened to you that it can pull all of these things together to present you with the kind of dream that will irritate you so much for three days that you'll have to look around for someone to talk to about it. Therefore, right, I told him that what it really looks like is that whatever goal the dream master has, the dream master must have the power to bring it to a conclusion. Because it's taking your present life, taking the dreams, showing you the two, if your conclusion is anyway similar to what's implicit in the dream as it relates to your past, then that very dream master must be in fact in agreement with the general conclusions that life is meaningful and you have to reach it. But what's interesting, quite interesting, is that the very process you have to go through to understand dreams means you then have to awaken your mind your own mind to a way of reasoning and that way of reasoning must have a parallel structure to the very way in which the dream was organized and designed. So therefore it awakens the mind to a new way of understanding or a new way of just understanding the operations and functions of the mind. If that's the case, then Dream Master, therefore, on this level, is functioning like a shepherd. Watches over to make sure things are okay. Warns you, tells you, connects with the present and the past. If that's true, then, it certainly has a great interest in our bringing about certain goods. Now, if it has all of that, then obviously this whole development is nothing other than presupposes that the dream master in itself must be of the nature of the good, must have vast, effective capability must have vast, effective capability and the sufficient power to bring it about and the kind of multimedia understanding of all of these things to make the work so artistically intriguing that it involves us directly and for a long period of time. Now, if that's the case, then there is no deflecting it from its purpose. Right? It has a purpose, our own good. Right? And it can't be deflected from it. It therefore must have some form of a will or direction, conscious direction, intelligible direction, which is another word for will. Oh. What do we have here? We have a dream. We have a past event. We have a discussion with this gentleman by the name of Peter. We went up to this point. He was shaky about going further. This is my construction after this. I led him through it, shared it over a cup of coffee. And so he asked, all right, look here. He said, look here. What is this? Does this have a name? What is this? And I said, Peter, you've got a good mind. 
because everything that we've talked about and each of the ways in which we spoke about it is this. Classically, in the Platonic tradition, what guided every step in this reasoning is the classic view of providence. Providence means, uh, literally, it is video to see, right? What comes before seeing, sometimes that's called forethought. But that's not really significant enough. It's really what is prior to the operations of the intellect. It's something that's prior to and above intellect that brings about a good. That's the definition of providence, which is pronoia in, in Greek. Now, when you explore philosophically in what we once here described as the dialectic, the dialectic proceeds this way. First, you must talk about the thing in itself. Then you must talk about it in terms of other things. Then you must talk about how the other things interrelate among themselves. Then you must talk about the way these things that interrelate among themselves relate back to the source, that is, whatever it is you're concerned with. These are the four stages of any dialectic. I took you just now through eight categories on providence because you can, the dialectical treatment of any idea is to talk about them in four positive ways and four negative ways. That is to say, you assume that providence exists, and then you assume that it doesn't exist. I started talking about, from Peter's background, with the four, assuming that it doesn't exist. I took you through the classic arguments of what is called the dialectic of providence. Then, since I went from eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, I went backwards and ended up, therefore, with the highest, the thing in itself, which is providence in itself. What does this mean, then? Well, Peter is in here, and we didn't have a chance to explore it. But what this means, then, is that the dream master, if all of this can be said, the dream master functions as providence. Therefore, the particular function of providence in human existence comes through and can be most readily seen personally. This is not an argument. This can be deduced from your own experience and explorations of dreams and analysis of them. That the dream master is truly a dream master, a master of dreams, working for our benefit and for our good. It comes before any reflection. It comes before any kind of intellectual work because it presupposes it's working for our good. Therefore, the dream master, we can say, functions as providence. And providence is in the realm of the divine. And since providence is in the realm of the divine, Greek thought, is in the realm of the divine. Therefore, we can conclude that the dream master has the quality of the divine functioning for our good providentially. It can be understood through these eight categories. We can see it functioning in our daily lives as it compares and relates both our present and past and hopefully brings us to understand our future. 
Ah, if that's the case, let's go back then. What did dreams and the dream master bring to us? That there is something in our power through this. What is in our power? That we can deal meaningfully with the circumstances that we find ourselves in on the highest level and with those around us. We can learn about certain opinions that we have about ourselves. We can turn them into hypotheses about our own lives and we can test them in our experience. This work brings us then to a knowledge of seeking patterns. It brings us to understanding by integrating and connecting our present and past. And in doing this, classically, this is called the first stage in beholding the intelligible because reality is said to be intelligible. I have a quote from my favorite philosopher who is responsible for all of the work I've just gone through, with Plato as well as Proclus. This comes from Proclus. The goal of man done through providence, through providence, through the agency of providence, is becoming a god as far as it is possible for the soul to be so. It will then understand the divine alone, it will grasp then the ineffable knowledge of all things according to the one within ourselves. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Now let's throw it open any way you want. blank page so we can work. <laughs> Would you like to go back and take a look at the dream? Well, you mean ours or? Pardon me? Was our dream or? The, oh, you have one with you? Uh, I've got a historical dream. A historical? Uh, it's not written down, but I've always had it for a while. I've had it and um, I keep trying to figure it out, but I, I possibly figure it out, but I don't know for sure. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see what we can do. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm work down. together. What? Sure. Okay. Um, there's a guy on a horse on the top of a mountain. On the top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. Ah, good. I'm always good at drawing horses. Yes. Go ahead. Actually, the horse is to the left, and the guy is looking to the left. He's looking to the left. He's looking to the left, and the horse is looking to the other side. And it's sort of, I'm really looking up at this mountain down there in the left-hand corner. Uh, I couldn't really tell what color it was at this point, the horse, but it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a black mountain. A black? Black mountain. It's black. It's, uh, the mountain was black? The mountain's black, and it's like blocks stacked on top of each other. What, what's stacked on top? It's, it's very blocky. Oh, okay, okay. Blocky. I'm good at drawing blocks. Go ahead. And um, all of a sudden, the horse and the rider start coming down the mountain on a path. And about, right about halfway down the mountain, all of a sudden, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the rider. I'm no longer watching it. I'm actually riding the horse. And um, I'm hanging on for dear life. And I'm scared stiff. Pardon me? I'm scared stiff. Scared. I'm scared. I think I'm going to die. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to hold on to this thing. And as I'm passing down there, uh, look at the side of the mountain, and I can see like this, um, 
it's like a slot and it's like water, it's like psychedelic, like oil in the water. Mm -hmm. It's got water on it, but it's got like an oily tinge to it. Um, it's a color, it's built color, like oil on water, so lots of colors. Um, and it's sort of a flat area. And I sort of want to stay there and look, but we keep flashing, we flash on by. Then all of a sudden, um, the horse and the rider, they come to a little tiny pool. And they both, uh, they both disappear into the pool. And I'm not the rider anymore. I'm sort of like watching this from some uh, rocks up onto the side there. So I, when I see them going into the pool and disappear, and I sort of say, wow, and I go over there and look in the pool. And um, I get up there on the edge of the pool, and I'm looking down in the pool, and the pool is sort of like, like that water again. It's sort of like, you know, with oil on it, got all kinds of colors. And then all of a sudden I get scared stiff, and I say, what happens if they come flying out of there again? They're going to maybe run me over and, 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 you know, hurt me or something. That's, that was a dream. I was, I was again. I was scared, and I, you know, I'm sort of scared that they were gonna, you know, come out of there and run over me. So I ran back to the rocks, I think, or something like that. I just ran away. So you have um, two frightening scenes, right? One you're hanging on for dear life on the horse, and the other is the fear that they may emerge, right? They may emerge quickly and fast and run you over. Right? Good, 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 good. Could you please talk about what it was like looking at the water in the slot with the water and oil? What was that like, state of mind? Would you just talk about it some more? Curious, uh, fascinating, curious. Uh, so more. I wanted to stay there. Um, it was sort of watery, moist. Um, it, was, it was wet in there. It was wet and black and dark. More, more, it's interesting. Mixture of oil and water. It, it also had the blocky structure. Hmm? It what? It had the blocky structure. It was like the, the blocks, the, the, the rocks are like blocks and smooth. Uh, what's that like? Ever seen anything like it? Um, not that I can't Any colors? Because here you did say it had color. The, the oily, the oily water. Yeah, was yeah just describe the colors. More? Um, blue, violet, green, changing. Um, attractive? Attractive? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, was, it caught my attention. It was right. curious, attractive. Curious, like a fire, you know, you can just watch it for a while. Like a fire? Right. 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 Like a fire? There's no fire there, but there's. Yeah, a, yeah. It's like sitting in front of, it could be like sitting in front of a fire. Yeah, okay. Um, it's an interesting state, Sarah. It's psychedelic colors. It's like watching a fire. Curious, you're drawn into it. Uh, other words? Um, I, I didn't get to stay there. I, I Could couldn't stay there. there. Yeah. I couldn't stay there. I got pulled away by yeah. the horse. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute now. Uh, actually, there was somehow another. I did get a chance to, to hang around there for a bit when I wasn't on the horse. I really, I, I did get a chance to hang in there, but I, 
you know, I didn't mm -hmm. write this down after That's I That's all right. But it, if I it comes back now, it's good. I did get a chance to hang around there and look around, mm -hmm. uh, either before or after or sometime. But I, was, I was hanging around in there for a while. Okay. Right. It's an interesting state of mind to be caught up in, right? You're watching the colors, they're psyched out, right? It's like gazing into a fire. Uh, you could easily stay there. Right. Curiosity. Um, as you consider that, is that similar to something that you could recall? Well, yeah. What? Um, and uh, this has sort of just come up since I started taking these classes. Uh, uh, I think actually that little box you got there is actually the, if you were looking under a car, the car was on the asphalt, which is black. Yeah. Uh, you'd be, and, and, the, and the asphalt was wet. Mm -hmm. and you were looking under there. You, you'd see, uh, you'd see the, the colors, and, mm -hmm. and you'd be looking under there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it would have that quality, mm -hmm. right? The way the colors are. Um, now. This had the kinds of colors that you recognize as psychedelic, right? It had the ability to pull you towards it, like gazing into the attractiveness of a fire, a glowing fire. Right. Could you add anything more to our picture? Um, I think there was another car further back that you could see underneath of that car. Mm -hmm. That's that sort of remember looking back there. Actually, it was more like. If there was a little box underneath the car, yeah. Like I, I was actually, it's like I'm actually right there. My head's on the ground. I'm looking under the car, and there's a window under there, and you, mm -hmm. you see a car in the distance in this square. Yeah. Square. How old were you? Uh, I was probably about two or three. Yeah. Fascinating. Wow. A lot of beauty. Um, <laughs> not really. Well, I mean, just the way you're describing it. Yeah, it's yeah, it was, it's. I'm 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 drawn to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the colors on the oil, oil and water mixing, gasoline, that kind of. Well, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm putting I'm putting a spin on it. I say it's not good. Well, it has an attractive quality, doesn't it? A certain kind of beauty draws you towards it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Do you remember anything else from that scene? Um, actually, you know, I, I think I, I was, um, this is an interpretation, I was actually pulled away from that scene, mm -hmm. which could be the horse running by. Yeah. I, was, I was actually physically pulled away from that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In every single, every single problem I have ever studied, and they run in above 10,000, I have never found one of these early scenes that has been so influential to the person that didn't start in a good state of mind. <laughs> this is a good state of mind. You know, actually, the, you're right. It is a good state of mind. It's a good state in, in of the mind. Dream, it was a very good state of mind. Okay. Someone else may have found that they didn't like you in that state of mind, may not have liked you enjoying that, participating in that for whatever reason, because they took you away. Yes. That, Everything is, there's, there's a possibility on that left, that one part you were talking about, they didn't want me enjoying that. There's, there's some interpretation on that. Well, yeah. oh, okay. well, whether they didn't want you to appreciate it, or they didn't like you there for whatever reason, the important thing is they didn't see how attractive you found it. Okay. All and right. therefore they are pulling you away from something that you saw as good. I 
That's interesting. Okay, yeah, that, I did. In the dream, it was, it was attractive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, was a cur it was curious. That's the, in the dream. It's curious. It's a it's a curious attraction. Yeah. I wanted to go there. Yeah. This is curious. You wanted to go there, right? Uh, no, and I found myself that there. That's why. It's okay. You found yourself there, but you did want to stay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. Now here's the problem. In every problem that we call a pathologos problem. It's a problem because we don't understand what they did. In this scene, right, with Peter, clearly, clearly did not understand, still doesn't understand what motivated his mother to do what she did. Doesn't understand why he said no. Didn't want know why she let him get away with it. There are a lot of unknowns in here that, he's, that, that keeps him at this point from being able to connect the parts the way he would like to. In every pathologo scene, it starts out when someone is in a good state of mind and someone interrupts it, pulls them away from it, in some way or another, separates them from it. Why is that a problem? Because then we have to then figure out why they did it. And in our way of viewing the universe, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. It doesn't make any sense. So we come to some kind of a half-baked conclusion, and that's our problem. But we don't put it into words because it never was in words. Okay. So you can only recall what you put into words. If it wasn't, okay. All right. And since it wasn't put into words, all you have is some half-baked, half-formulated way of understanding this event. Okay. Do you, do you think uh, the horse jumping in the water has some, since it followed, has something to do with this? Maybe? That's where we're going. All right. Now. Uh, we're going to do the same thing here. There you are. You're attracted to the small pool of water where the horse and rider disappeared into. You have that question. What happens? And what would happen if they came out fast and ran over me? That's a state of mind. We're going to do the same thing with that that we did with the other. Now you're worried of the reappearance from that very sort. What's that like? Same, same questions. Anything at all that comes up, we'll take anything. I got a flash on this. Okay, Just try. right now. Yeah. I asked myself, who was that riding on the horse? Because I think I know who the horse is. Uh -huh. I think that was my mother riding on my father. Mm -hmm. That's what I think That's it was. Right. I think it was right. my, my father's the black horse. Mm -hmm. And I, my mother, I think, was, was okay. riding the horse. All right. I'm not sure, though. You know, that did right. flash, so. No, it's, it's okay. Out. Come on. See? But rather than identify who the f what, what or who the figures are, mm -hmm. I'm interested in that state of mind that you're into. Right. Okay. There you are, fascinated now with the pool. It's a small pool. And you have this question, what would happen if they came out? Fast. Scary. What's that like? Uh, it's, it's enough to make me get up and, and run and head for cover. That's the scene we're looking at. Yes, it had the effect that it made you get up and run out. That's right. That's right. 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 Just consider that. Consider that. Right. Put you in that state. Right. Put you in state such a state that you get out quick. Right. Right. What's that? Where does that? Anything similar to that in your past?
Well, I think in my life I've been curious about things, and then sometimes I get involved with them, and they're. Oh, just give me one. Doesn't matter. Just, uh, hey, I understand you've been, you enjoy that state of being curious, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we all do. But that, you, you have an interest in that kind of state of mind, too. Right? Being curious, that's a, a very high state. Yeah. And now that you're fascinated by it, they may reappear right, and run you over. But I just ra rather, rather now that there's a fascination. You're curious, right? You're yeah, curious that, about it. Even in that water, even in all those, yeah. that water is the same colors again. Mm -hmm. Draws you. Mm -hmm. Draws you. It's attractive, it's beautiful, it draws you again. It's gets you, that makes you curious. Actually, what drew me there was, I was just, wow, those guys Go went into that little puddle of water and disappeared. Mm -hmm. How can they do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I go to check it out and mm -hmm. I get scared when I'm looking in there because they might come flying out of there. Mm -hmm. They might come flying out. Well, they did get in the car. My mom and dad did get in the car. Go ahead. They did get in the car. And? And we drove off. Mm -hmm. um, uh, shoot, I don't know if the puddle has anything to do with the car or what. Uh, we don't. Just. Um, you see. You know something about yourself now, two and three, and that is that there's something that you're drawn towards. It interests you. You find it attractive. There's a certain beauty to it. Right? It awakens a certain curiosity. You're drawn then. To, right. So. Um, well, I'm also. I go to the beach. I'm scared to get in the water. And as a kid, I was afraid to go in swimming pools. And to this day, I can't swim. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have gotten in the pool, and some people have showed me how to swim, but I just avoid yeah. pools of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a swimming pool around where I go, and it's, mm -hmm. I've been in a swimming pool once in four years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, they pulled you away from it. Sorry? They pulled you away from it. Uh, you were pulled away from what you found very attractive. Mm -hmm. Find it interesting that uh, this could be said that the mother pulled him away from his friend. And he ends the friendship. You're pulled away from that scene, and you make some kind of conclusion about that event, and since then, you don't return to it. Uh, when was the dream you had? When was that dream? I had that dream probably about six years ago. Mm -hmm. looked at it and looked at it, but when, you know, in your class I've been looking at this, what the symbols mm -hmm. mean, and um, so you, you see, see, you that, avoided all water since, could this be the origin of it? It might, see that, Pardon? I was, I was thrown on the ground there. Oh. I just didn't crawl there myself, I was thrown there. In what way? Talk about it. 
I was thrown there on the ground. Go ahead. Wow. Go ahead. See, originally I was in that car. Uh huh. And I was in that car for a long time. Uh huh. While my brother was being born in the hospital. Uh huh. And my mom and dad had left me in the car. Mm hmm. And when they, uh, when my father came back, he's actually, I think, the big mountain that I'm looking up at. Uh, I was scared stiff. And when he opened the car door, I think I jumped out and grabbed around him and was trying to hold on to him because I was scared stiff because I was in the car alone. You know, I didn't know what was mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually, um, he actually, I think he pulled me off and threw me on the ground. Mm -hmm. And when he threw me on the ground, I was under the, I was by the car there looking out. Mm -hmm. And then somehow or another, um, see that's, that me holding on to the horse is mm -hmm. I think me struggling with him to hold on to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he tossed me on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then I think he, I don't know what he did next. I don't remember it much, but I do know that the horse went to a pool after that. Mm -hmm. um, pool of water. So that's as much as I'm going to make out. Yeah, you see, what, what do we have? We know that, um, like in this stream, it ended the relationship with the friend. It ended the relationship with water, right? Yeah, I was, yeah, that's, it ended. I didn't think of it like then that. Then something right. happened six years ago that awoke your interest again in this curiosity. Go ahead. I go to the beach. Or I go to the swimming pool. I can get in a swimming pool because I can see below the surface of the water. If I go to the beach, I can go out in the water sometimes, mm -hmm. but I'm always scared stiff mm -hmm. that something is going to come up and jump out of the water and get me. Same thing. Same thing. That's actually my fear of, the, of, of mm -hmm. water. I mean, the ocean, I can't see what's in the water, so mm -hmm. I am, I'm always mm -hmm. worried that something's mm -hmm. going to jump out and get mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. What happened six years ago? Just anything significant that you can recall? Uh, I was in a relationship with someone. Uh, I was going to possibly be married or so. And, uh, we didn't get married. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there was something, right? You went back to this that allowed you to re examine it once more. And you fled. And then you fled. And now you're raising the possibility, and we have to be really cautious about this. The reason I say cautious, before you can come to a conclusion like this, you want to make sure that you have a whole series of dreams where you can see these themes ex being explored over a long period of time before you can come to a conclusion about wondering. I found that again and again to be true. Um, well, I do have another worse dream. Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, just, just, to, just to stay, you see, if what you're saying is correct, that this scene when you're thrown down, uh, that was certainly traumatic. High expectations and thrown down. Um, see, we can now watch. We're now going to shift a little bit and talk about a sign. You talked about these blocks. Right? In a dream, you want to see whether it's possible to find the significance of what's being used in the dream as images, as a way of connecting them. Because did you not say that where you saw this slot, there were blocks there as well? You were also behind rocks, weren't you? Right? Uh, what is this blocks? What comes to your mind? Car windows. Car windows. Hmm. Right. So more and more, it looks like we're finding parallels, doesn't it? It's also um, strength. These rocks are big too, so mm -hmm. you know. It's but 
you see, if you go back to that, if you go back to that, would you not agree if that's the case that you're worried about the reappearance of that same kind of uh, intensity? And uh, actually, you know, this, this yeah. whole when I look back at the dream, I look at it, see it. Actually, this this whole thing, see that mountainside. This all this action was taking place in this big mountain. And you know that when he came down mm -hmm. to that block there, it's still like a big mountain sure. in the background. Yeah, you said it was half. This was really take, took place just about halfway down the path. About halfway down, and then at the bottom, at the foot, is where the, um, mm -hmm. the pool is. Yeah. And actually, the pool is over on the right side because this thing was all the way down this way, and mm -hmm. the rocks that you know are at the base of the mountain. Um, so it, it's happened on top of this big mountain. Uh, I don't know whether that's, you know, what comes up see, is it, it's... See, what's interesting about, uh, one of the things that's interesting about this dream is the fact that uh, uh, it, it looks like there are many parallels, but the thing that you find attractive and most interesting in is what you're seeing underneath the car in the past, and what you're seeing here in that slot, and what you're seeing in that little pool. At the radium, the most interesting thing, the most curious thing that, that caught me was actually the horse jumping in the pool. And that's the most, that had the biggest charge on it, with, with, the, with the other ones being secondary. That's probably nine. And the other one's like seven and a half. Oh, very good. They're both pretty curious situations. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, that's a state of mind when you see that. And that's why it would be worthwhile knowing what's similar to that in your life. Is there a niner that's in that state of mind? If this ranks among those experiences you've had as a nine, could you mention something that had similar effects on you in your life? Similar effects. See, what it is like is to ask for a simile. Right. To ask the identity of things in the dream is to ask uh, what is it as a metaphor. So we're after the simile. What is it like? All right, you said it's a niner. All right, say among the experiences you've had where you had that state of mind. Well, it's not okay, it's not necessary. Hmm? Uh, well, I've had a couple experiences that are real niners. Um, they, well, actually, copy out a couple. Actually, I was in a hole, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, I got there out of curiosity, mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't get out of the hole, mm -hmm. and um, and I didn't know whether I was going to live or die when I was in the hole, mm -hmm. and that was a niner, mm -hmm. and um, it was very scary, very fearful. Sure. Another experience I had um, was I did some drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I did these drugs, and they had all the lights and everything that mm -hmm. was in the water here. And um, actually, I jumped out of a window on the first floor into the snow, mm -hmm. and with no T-shirt on. And I was looking up at the stars and going, "Wow, this is incredible!" And the, the, the wind chill factor must have been minus 60, and I was standing out there, you know. No big deal. That was a niner. That was it had, a niner. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a tenor. <laughs> it had you know it had all the lights and things, um, but, but that's you know, I, I don't see the corollaries. You know. Well, you know, I was curious about my friends. You know, got my curiosity. You know, up. Um, well, you see, um, if we keep pushing this now, it looks like we can rank a series of experiences that you've had that are similar to this 
And the more you talk about them, not only are they intense, but they also include the last one, attractive beauty. These are extremely intense interpersonal experiences. And what this dream is, is just on the surface, therefore, is coming to, is that you are very much attracted to the Niners, but there's a fear of what may come out of it, and that's similar to the ocean, things like that. Actually, the, uh, the fear was reinforced, because mm -hmm. one of my friends who had the, the drugs, and when I did these things again, I got a chance to look into the circle, mm -hmm. into the, like, the flashing lights, and actually I was looking in a mirror, and um, I turned into an alligator. And it scared the living daylights out of me. And so, in a sense, something had come up out of the water mm -hmm. and done something to me. And that was a night or two. Well, the th question then that we would pose would be, always we ask this one question again and again, why did the dream come at this point in your life? Right. Um, and um, see, I can't really tell you that six years. Yeah, five yeah, that's why it's that's why you need fresh, yeah. yeah, where you can get that and the accuracy of terms because over the years key words may change, but <clears throat> it does show a fascination for these kinds of phenomena, and it does show that you want to experience it, doesn't it? Just pulling together what you've already said. And yet what's blocking you from getting deeper into it fear. is this fear. And therefore, what would happen then if you decide to deal with that fear? You can then participate more fully in the thing that you find most intriguing and curious and interesting. So what the fear is, is I'm going to get uh, annihilated or run over or trampled on. Yeah, and we want to know what does that mean? Well, actually, the two niners, one niner was, you know, physical destruction, possibly, and the other one was psychological destruction. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. There's, there's two situations where... Yeah, yeah. Hanging on for dear life repeats itself. Oh, that's even better, because... Right? Well, yeah, there's actually, I was on a, in a truck once, mm -hmm. and the truck uh, was driving very fast, and I was sitting in the truck, and I was at a computer terminal, and the whole side of the truck got blown off, and the next thing I knew, I was holding on to the, the, the side of the wall, mm -hmm. because the truck was picking up speed really fast mm -hmm. to try and get out of there, and, and all of us inside of the thing, you know, we were holding on for dear life, and I was literally holding on to the inside of the truck, trying to keep from being, like, swept out of the truck, mm -hmm. and all these, like, file cabinets, and gear was like just streaming by me and, and flying by and again yeah, scared stiff holding on to mm -hmm. not the neck but mm -hmm. I was holding on to a, a side wall. What's nice about this dream, thank goodness, is that you survive them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be interested in seeing whether these themes reappear sometimes if you want to explore it. Um, there's some things that um, that have, you know, it's all very, very significant. Um, but I'm still puzzled by, you know, that, that horse going in the. I, I don't get the. I don't get the bottom line on it. I really don't. So I think you're right. I need to, I need to, you know, concentrate on this. And, um, well, see, I've been concentrating on it, you know, thinking about it and everything. Sometimes things will sort of like get a, you know, a flash on it, but I haven't really worked with it in like a, from a dream approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although there is a, there is another dream that has to do with. It's a horse dream with me riding see? the horse. See. But. See. What happens when you get a series of them is that whatever, whatever you're puzzled about, 
in another series of dreams that may show itself like a different facet that you can then adjust your seeing of this one and they all come together in a connected fashion. Because the whole basis of what we're doing here is to say that <clears throat> if, if, we, if we don't find a way into some intelligible direction, we're left with fate. So basically I should go to sleep at night and sort of ask myself uh, what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Some more input. That's what exactly what Plato says. See, he has all kinds of interesting techniques, you might call them, for meditation. But there's only one advice he gives about gaining knowledge of your own self, your present and past, and that's dreams. And that's been a guiding thought for many Platonists over the centuries. And that's where I'm at, and that's what I represent. My pleasure, I assure you. Thank you for volunteering. Good, thank you. Good. And that ends our great series on dream work with fate and providence. Thank you.